Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this web lecture in which we will discuss the free movement of goods as used in the European Union, not to be confused with the European Onion. And this onion will play a dominant role in the upcoming web lecture. You will find out why in just a few minutes. Um, as you may know, uh, the idea, one of the main ideas of the European Union is to facilitate trade between its member states by lowering all trade barriers. Uh, one of the uh, means to do so is to establish um, um, the free movement of goods between all the member states of the European Union, as you can see here. And this is predominantly done by two main ideas. The first is to get rid of all fiscal restrictions. And a fiscal restriction means that one country upholds a financial restriction against another country. Um, and this usually has something to do with tax. So you pay either tax for crossing the border with your goods or tax is used to discriminate against foreign products. Another way to establish the free movement of goods is by getting rid of all quantitative restrictions. A quantitative restriction means that one country upholds a certain quota or something that has a similar effect uh, against foreign products. So that would mean, for instance, that you can only import 50 pieces of particular products of, of onions, for instance. Um, so it does not relate to taxation or money, but it relates to the quota, the amount of products you can at some point sell in a given country. Those two restrictions to trade we want to get rid of within the European Union. However, the way this is done is rather complicated and uh, it, it requires some further explanation. Let's start with the fiscal restrictions and then afterwards we will talk about the uh, quantitative restrictions. As I already um, kind of hinted at, there are two ways uh, a country can use a fiscal restriction to, um, well, favor its own domestic products over foreign products. And this is something we do not want because we want to establish one common zone through which products, doesn't matter from which country these products origin, um, can be sold uh, on equal footage. So we want to level the playing field, uh, both in fiscal terms and in non-fiscal terms. So. The first fiscal restriction that is forbidden is the usage of import and export taxation. This is forbidden in Article 30 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. A practical example would be this. Imagine the German would want to sell onions at the Dutch market. And the Dutch uphold a custom duty on onions. This would mean that the German, while crossing the border, have to pay an additional sum of money in order to enter the Dutch market. This sum of money is not paid by the Dutch producers who do not have to pay such a tax because they simply do not cross the border. This situation would favor the Dutch producers over the German producer and would lead to a fiscal restriction to trade. Now, this is banned under Article 30 TFEU. A second type of fiscal restrictions that is prohibited within the European Union is the abuse of a domestic tax policy in order to favor domestic products over foreign products. This is forbidden in Article 110 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. An example would be this. Imagine we have the German onions again. In Germany, they produce a lot of onions. In the Netherlands, they barely produce any onions at all. Now, for obvious reasons, the Germans want to sell their onions in the Netherlands. They cross the border and they are not charged any custom duties. So, in that sense, they can um, participate in the Dutch market on equal footage compared to any Dutch producer. However, in the Netherlands, the government adopted a national tax policy uh, that requires an additional taxation on the sales of onions at the supermarket. They fall in a higher tax category compared to any other uh, products that are substitute products to onions. In practice, this would mean that the German would find it probably harder to sell the onions in the Netherlands compared to substitute products that may be produced by Dutch producers. So while technically the domestic tax policy is not discriminating directly against German onions, in practice it has a similar effect because the Dutch hardly produce any onions and most likely the Dutch consumer would want to buy substitute products uh, instead of the onions from Germany due to the additional taxation. Okay, so now we've discussed the fiscal restrictions. 
Let's now discuss the quantitative restrictions. They are forbidden in Article 34 or 35 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, depending whether you talk about import or export. But they both stay the same. Um, a quantitative restriction could be literally quota. That means you can only import 500,000 pieces of onion to my country and that's about it. Um, could also mean you can uh, import zero pieces of onions into my country. Um, both cases it's just forbidden because it's a quota. You cannot uphold any quota within the European Union. This is the most uh, well-known example of a quantitative restriction and probably uh, this will barely ever happen within the European Union unless um, we talk about serious risks for uh, public health or something like that. But we will discuss that later when we discuss Article 36 of the TFEU. For now, it is interesting to state that countries are not crazy. Um, so they will probably not uphold literally a quota because they know very well that this is forbidden in the uh, context of the European Union. However, sometimes a country um, is clever and they uphold at some point a rule that actually has the same effect as a quota to trade, but is not directly a quotum in itself. We call these rules measures having equivalent effect. M-E-E, -E, although in some textbooks they use some other abbreviations. Now, what is a measure having equivalent effect? The concept of the measure having equivalent effect was introduced by the European Court of Justice in their famous Dassonville ruling, which dates back to 1974. The case goes slightly like this. Two Belgian brothers owning their liquor store in the south of Belgium sell, obviously, whiskey. However, at that moment in time, the Belgian government adopts a new rule on the sales of whiskey. If you want to sell whiskey, you should possess a certificate of origin just to prove that you're actually selling the real stuff and not illegally brewing stuff that people produce somewhere uh, in their homes. Now, the Belgian brothers had a very long-lasting uh, relationship with some French wholesalers because, well, they live close to the border and it's easy to uh, purchase your products you want to sell to your customers um, through one channel, through one wholesaler, um, compared to a situation in which you have to buy each and every product individually directly from the producers. However, in France there was no such rule that you would have to have a certificate of origin in order to sell whiskey. This led to a problem because the French wholesalers would not have such certificates of origin and when the Belgian brothers um, buy the whiskey through the French wholesalers, they simply could not comply with the Belgium rules because the Belgium rule dictate that you would have to have such a certificate of origin. Now, the only option left for the, uh, for the Belgian brothers was to directly purchase, for instance, scotch from the producers in Scotland. However, this would lead to more expenses because it's more expensive to directly buy it from Scotland than when you buy all your liquor at once through one wholesaler. Now, the Belgian brothers were very creative, so they faked their own uh, certificates of origin to still comply with the Belgian law and at the same time be able to buy their whiskey through the French wholesaler. But they get caught. Now, this particular situation ended up in court and the Belgian brothers defended themselves by quoting Article 34 of the TFEU that forbids all quantitative restrictions to trade. And they said, you know what, if I cannot, if this particular Belgian law uh, creates a situation um, and as a result I cannot buy any whiskey or scotch from France or from fresh wholesalers, then this comes down to a quotum with a quotum of zero. This is directly forbidden under Article 34 of the TFEU. While, in fact, the Belgium rule in itself does not establish quota, it has a same effect. Now, the European Court of Justice agreed and said, well, this is a forbidden quota and therefore it's a violation of Article 34 TFEU because this is a measure that has a same effect. Now, let's have a closer look at the phenomenon of a measure having equivalent effect because since 1974 we've seen an entire chain of case law further specifying this phenomenon. First of all, we can make a distinction in two types of measures having an equivalent effect to quota. The first is um, a distinctively applicable MEE. This means that the measure in itself directly aims 
uh, at foreign products. So for instance, if I would create a law that says, if you want to sell onions in the Netherlands, well, you don't have to pay any tax. There is no additional value added tax, so it has nothing to do with a fiscal restriction. But we don't trust these German onions. So you have to um, submit these onions for an additional inspection. Um, this additional inspection will take more time and is at some point a, uh, a limitation to trade. It is a physical limitation to trade and therefore because it directly aims at the foreign product it is a distinctively applicable measure having equivalent effect. It doesn't directly impose quota but it does hinder trade and that could lead to at some point less sales and therefore a quota. The other side would be an indistinctively applicable measure having equal equivalent effect. Well, this is a little bit more complicated to explain and therefore we use the following court case. Um, the Cassis de Gion ruling is one of the first court cases in which the idea of an indistinctively applicable measure having equivalent effect was introduced. This court ruling dates back to 1978, a few years later compared to the Dossonville ruling. A French producer produced a liquor called Cassis de Gion. The liquor would contain 15 to 20 percent of alcohol. They wanted to export this product to German markets. However, there was a slight problem. In Germany, there was a rule that would stipulate that you can only sell something under the name liquor if it had uh, at least 25 percent of alcohol. This would practically mean that if you want to sell Cassis de Gion in Germany, the French producer would have to change the label, the layout of the product, but also their transportation channels and sales channels. This would lead to a significant effort and maybe also a significant investment in order to comply with the German rules. This added up in court and uh, the French producer claimed that the German rule would lead to a discrimination to trade against the French product. The European Court of Justice assessed this particular situation and in the end ruled that while the German rule in itself does not directly discriminate against French products or foreign products, the rule as such has a discriminatory effect. It does not necessarily exclude foreign producers from the German market because the rule should be obeyed by Germans as well. However, it would have a practical effect um, that the French cannot sell their uh, liquor in Germany under the same circumstances as the German producers. So um, this leads to a limitation to trade forbidden under Article 34 and 35 of the TFEU because this measure has the same effect as some kind of a quota because in practice the French would probably sell less of their products in Germany um, due to this particular German rule. Now, from this case, we can learn two uh, additional things. The first is the principle of mutual recognition. Um, this means that we can learn from this case that once a product was lawfully produced in one country, and there is no European rule about this or something like that, um, you should be able to sell this same product under the same circumstances in the other country. And any law that is uh, at some point interfering with that process is most likely against um, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. It's in conflict with those rules. The second thing we can learn from it is the rule of reason. Um, at some point, the court assessed the German arguments and the court claimed that, well, you know, if you really have a good reason for this rule, um, if this is really necessary for, for instance, public health issues or to uphold a system of fiscal supervision or to contribute to healthy functioning markets or whatsoever, we're fine. But unfortunately, the, German could, the Germans could not convince the court um, that there was such a rule of reason to uphold this 25 percentage uh, of alcohol demand. And as a result, they lost the case. So, since then, this particular German rule was quashed and doesn't exist anymore. The Cassis de Gion ruling has led to a very broad understanding of when a domestic rule would be indistinctively applicable and as a result, in the end, forbidden. However, in the Keck et Mitois ruling, the European Court of Justice drew a particular line. Here is the case. Two supermarket managers sold beer and coffee uh, below the cost price, which was at that moment forbidden in France. The supermarket was in France. 
Therefore, the supermarket managers were tried in court because this was a violation of the French rules. However, the supermarket managers claimed, you know what, there is this uh, principle of mutual recognition we've learned from the Cassis de Dion ruling. And in some other European countries, you can sell products below cost price. So if I can do it in other countries, then I should be able to do it in France as well. So what I did is not forbidden. It's not a violation of the law. The French rules should be ad adjusted. Now, the Court of Justice disagreed. Why? Because the French rule was not about product demands. It was not about the product in itself. It was more about a sales modality, which is the circumstances under which you can sell a product. So what we can learn from all this is that countries are able, are allowed to adopt indistinctively applicable measures as long as it concerns sales modalities. That is, the circumstances under which you can sell a product. The idea that you cannot sell products below a cost price is clearly a sales modality. Now, we have to sum up a little bit. At first, we have quantitative restrictions. They are forbidden under Article 34 and 35 of the TFEU. We can subdivide them under a quota, which is forbidden and barely ever used in the European Union, or a more hidden measure having equivalent effect. It's the same effect as a quota. These measures can be subdivided in distinctively applicable measures because they directly aim at export or import of products or uh, indistinctively applicable measures. They do not aim at any foreign products at all, but they have the practical effect that they discriminate against foreign products. These indistinctively applicable measures can be subdivided into sales modalities and product demands. We see that countries can allow themselves more freedom uh, in the case of indistinctively applicable measures when they are a sales modality, when the rules say something about the circumstances under which you can sell a product, compared to the product demand. These are rules that specify what products should comply with. Uh, think about uh, an alcohol percentage or something like that. Now, there is one general exemption to all this. In general, we have the regime of Article 36 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. This article enables countries to uphold any quantitative restriction as long as they comply with the wordings of Article 36 TFEU. Mind you, these are about serious issues, such as um, safeguarding public health of a particular country. Think about the BSE crisis. Um, at some point, the British cows were affected with BSE, which can cause the kreutzfeldt jakob syndrome when it's consumed by humans. Um, as a result, the European country on the mainland banned all the British cows from their markets. This is a quota of zero, but they could justify this under Article 36 of the TFEU. Now, just to complete the picture, we want to add to this overview the fiscal restrictions as well. As you may remember, fiscal restrictions can be narrowed down to two types. Um, an import and an export tax and the abuse of a national tax policy in order to discriminate against foreign products. So, all this is a um, little summary of uh, the European Union free movement of goods in a nutshell. I hope you've learned a few things and thank you very much for watching. Music